Professor Deaton, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, doing this interview. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Um, when we were uh, getting ready to do this interview, we exchanged an email or two, and uh, you mentioned that uh, there's a lot to be, that you, that you are um, quite saddened and pessimistic about the COVID itself, but uh, that compared to other pandemics, uh, there is much to be optimistic about. Can you explain what you meant by that? Well, really very much for the reasons that you, you put in your original email. You know, we haven't had a pandemic like this for 100 years. And, you know, if you compare what people didn't know what they were dying of then, right? And now, we, you know, we decoded the D DNA or at least the RNA of this virus within days, or at least the Chinese have. So, you know, it, it's something you and I have often talked about. I mean, you know, the Enlightenment really helped us. <laughs> And post-enlightenment, we, we try to think about these things and reason them through. And over the broad sweep of history, that really works. And you can see it working here. It doesn't mean that we're going to get a vaccine next week or even next year. And it doesn't mean we're going to get a medicine, which would be a terrific thing. I think maybe that would be the most hopeful immediate thing. But there's a huge amount of people working on it with a huge amount of scientific knowledge. And our chances of doing that are so much better than they were in 1918, let alone, you know, in 1640 or whatever you're talking about, when people had no idea what was happening to them. So we have some control. Um, it may not be perfect control. And, you know, this is certainly something that will teach us not to be too hubristic about the world. The world is a dangerous place and bad things will happen. But I think a lot of us thought that this would not happen um, that the days of these things were behind us. So it's a sort of rude shock, but there's much to be learned from it. But we have just a huge amount of knowledge, um, a huge amount of technology, a huge amount of good stuff that will, um, you know, help us in a way that just wasn't possible before. So that's a reason for being relatively optimistic without, you know, falling into the trap of saying, we'll beat this in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, would you agree that there was a bit of a psychological shift in the last 200 or 250 years? I mean, in the past, when a pandemic occurred, um, people tried to protect themselves, but ultimately uh, felt that there was nothing that anybody could do about it except pray. Uh, whereas now we sort of uh, expect this pandemic to be tackled. In other words, the, the psychological uh, change I'm talking about is an expectation that we can conquer this. Yeah, it, I, expectation is a little strong. Um, you know, we don't have a virus for the common cold. We don't have a vaccine for the common cold. We don't have a vaccine that works very well for flu. And I think that's probably because we didn't care enough. My um, virus researcher friends say that we could have that if we devoted enough resources to doing it. So maybe in the end, that's because we didn't really care about that. But yeah, I mean, the expectation is that we should be able to tackle this and that we have a good chance of success. Um, I think people, but that's the enlightenment, you know, people stop praying. <laughs> or, or at least they stop, you know, just turning themselves over to God and to the king and actually started thinking for themselves. And boy, does that work. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, different responses to the pandemic. Let's start with advanced countries, the developed world, and then switch over to developing countries. So how would you assess the, uh, the, the wisdom and the efficacy of uh, what, say, the developed countries have tried to do? Well, I think that one shouldn't expect too much. It's very important to start with that and say, you know, nothing like this has happened for a hundred years. Um, and it really is the war metaphor, I think, is often useful here. Because at the beginning of wars, there's usually chaos, <laughs> including chaos in the armed forces. You have the wrong generals. You have the generals that led in peacetime, and they're useless when it comes to actually fighting. And then it takes a few years, and you sort that out, and you get the people who can do this. So I, I'm not too hard on countries you know, that didn't have perfect responses. And to say you should have been prepared, 
we should have had more ventilators, we should have had more hospital beds, we should have had more ICUs. I mean, it's completely crazy to have all these ventilators if we won't need them again for 100 years. And so there's going to be a lot of panic, a lot of stupid things done. When people are frightened, they don't behave very well. Um, and so I think the political response, which has been very spotty, um, and it's very easy with hindsight to say what you should have done. So I'm not too harsh um, on what countries have done. They've been taken by surprise. Um, that said, there clearly are, you know, some leaders have done come out of this much better than other leaders. And some people seem to rise to those tasks and some people are not so capable of doing that. Um, I think it has been very important for um, rich countries to not to try and stimulate the economy. I hate this term stimulus because that's not what we're trying to do here. We've deliberately slowed down the economy. And what we need to do is make sure that people don't suffer too much while the economy is deliberately being slowed down. That's much harder to do in poorer countries where the resources are not so easily available. And the trade-offs there are obviously different because there just isn't as much money available. And it's been real torture in places like India and in South Africa, I think, where um, you know the losses in terms of people not having enough to eat seem very immediate and very severe. And the risks of the pandemic in the short run look not very severe, but it's very hard to tell whether they're going to go on not being severe. Yeah, I spent some time uh, in my youth uh, living in South Africa, and obviously I keep in touch with a lot of people there. And uh, there seems to be, um, certainly among my friends, uh, sort of surprise and shock at uh, the government's action, uh, partly because uh, uh, people have been confined to their shacks where there's much greater um, um, much greater multitude of people, uh, but also because of some actions the government has taken in terms of food provision and hunger is really spreading. So I think there is a bit of a shock and panic in, in South Africa, certainly. I don't know much about India. No, I think India is rather similar. Um, that I, I mean, I followed the South African thing a little bit too, because, you know, and it's very sharp there that the social distancing just doesn't work for people who live in the shack towns or in Cape Town or wherever. Um, and so the people who benefit are very different from the people whose lives are being put at risk. And, and so there, there's a big inequality trade-off there. And I think the same is true in India. In India, they gave no notice and they closed down all public transport. And there's the food distribution system, such as it is, depends on you being at home. And so, Millions of migrant workers had to try and get home after the, you know, railways had been closed, the buses had been closed. And so that seems poor decision making. It was done, you know, without much thought, without much preparation um, in a way that, and it smacks of a panic reaction. I was very surprised in South Africa, they closed the liquor stores. I mean, that seemed like a terrible thing to do. <laughs> the circumstances. And in America, the liquor stores are doing a roaring trade, you know, I mean, I don't know why you'd want to deny that to people under the circumstance. Um, yeah, I mean, there's the added component to that, uh, that uh, it, it's possible the government in South Africa might use uh, the uh, COVID crisis to uh, uh, put further screws on the South African economy and to try to nationalize ever larger chunks uh, of the economy, which I think in the long run would be quite disastrous. Yeah, no, but that's not just in South Africa. I mean, the dangers of populist and nationalist takeovers are almost everywhere. And I think these pandemics certainly, um, you know, raise that as a real danger, real possibility. If only because, you know, in the short run, we do need to have some central direction. I mean, this is not a problem that individuals can solve by themselves. Um, and so the danger is that you grant these temporary powers which are needed and that they turn into, you know, long term loss of freedom for people, which would be very serious. Would it be fair to summarize your position as uh, saying that uh, in the advanced countries, 
uh, lockdown or shutdown or whatever you want to call it um, was probably the best they could do, but in developing countries they shouldn't. Is, is that? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be that strong. Um, I think what I said about India is that there should have been much more preparation for doing that if they were going to do it. Um, on the question of whether they should have done it or not is not something I have the data or knowledge. You know, one of the big things about the current situation is just how incredible amounts of uncertainty there are. So there are all sorts of terrible outcomes that are possible if they're not very likely. And it could be that, you know, 70% of the Indian population could get infected. Um, they're much younger than the population in the US, but there'll be millions of deaths if that happens. And if that's the thing you think is going to happen, then the lockdown might be a good thing to do. But we're also probably exaggerating the effects of the lockdown um, or the effects of the orders for lockdown, meaning that many people are not very keen on going out right now because they're scared. And, um, you know, I'm sure there are some people who respond to the orders, but um, a lot of people would change their behavior left to themselves. Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, how much of the economic pain do you think, especially in Western countries, advanced economies, um, in the long run will be attributable to uh, the sickness itself? And how much of it will be attributable to uh, the lockdown? I mean, almost impossible to tell. I mean, unless we know how long it's going to last. You know, at the beginning, we thought there'd be a V shaped um, recession, that this would all be over in a month or two. And these terrible projections that were being sold out of the University of Washington, you know, said all the dying would be done by 1st of May. And I think policymakers paid a lot of attention to those numbers, um, which I think was a mistake. But if it's going to work for a long time, it's a much harder, it's a much harder problem. And that trade off, you know, I mean, I don't think we can continue lockdown in its current form for very much longer. And I don't think we ought to. And I think we need serious work. You know, there's been no pandemic for 100 years. We're not living in an economy that is infection proofed, as it were. And if the thing has been, that's distressed me a little is people are beginning to think about it, but I don't think there's enough work going on on to think how to make, how do you make an airplane really safe? I mean, there's huge incentives for the airlines to do that. Maybe they'll get right to it. Um, you know, how do you redesign offices so that people can work in those offices in a way that does not cause them to start another pandemic or continue another one? And I think we all think now this is something that's likely to happen again. What do you think about um, modeling? I mean, uh, part of the reason why we had these shutdowns was because every government ended up with some sort of a model that was showing uh, you know, severe crisis. Um, these models are being constantly reworked. They are constantly changing. Um, now, I don't want to be too harsh, but I guess the question would be, um, what is a proper role in society for modeling and how serious should people take them? I think they have to take it very seriously. I mean, they have to recognize the degree of uncertainty um, and to understand that models are models. The word model has been tossed around a lot in ways that I would not use it, for instance. I mean, to me, that models have to have some basic scientific content and curve fitting, you know, does not, to me, satisfy that criterion because there's no understanding of how this disease is progressing. So I think the people who actually know something about virology and about how viruses spread have been more accurate and more helpful on this than the people who just fitted curves to the data. That's not to say there isn't a role for that. You know, I I download the data every morning and I peer at the tea leaves and try to see whether the things that people are saying are going to happen are going to happen. Um, and, you know, that's very useful. You've absolutely got to um, look at the data and see whether they're matching what the scientists are telling you. But I think we really have to combine all those sources of knowledge. And I think it's very dangerous just simply to accredit the status of modeling to people who are not really modeling at all. One of the patterns that seems to be emerging, I wonder if you agree, 
uh, is uh, the, the beauty of smallness, that small countries seem to be much better at uh, tackling the virus. Now, I don't think that applies universally. I mean, there's Belgium and so forth, but most countries that have done a decent job have been uh, small ones. Uh, is there something to it or is that premature? I hadn't thought of that actually, and it's interesting. Um, I do think that the US being so big is problematic. Um, because it's so hard, you know, to seal borders between states, for example. Well, there's a certain amount of that going on. You know, Rhode Island has a quarantine for anyone coming from out of state. So does Montana. Um, other states may do too. Um, and, you know, if you're Switzerland or something, it's much easier to close your borders than if you're Rhode Island. Um, so, but I don't know, I haven't thought about that systematically. Well, one of the things that you are famous for uh, in your research is deaths of despair. Uh, what do you think is the impact of COVID going to have on these deaths of despair? Well, there's a, a stuff going around that makes me very unhappy, makes both Anne and I very unhappy. And people are saying that the lockdowns will cause enormous numbers of deaths of despair and the lockdowns are worse than the virus. And they can say that if they want, but there's no basis at all for that in our work. And in fact, you know, one of the standard slides we like to show is a picture of deaths of despair, suicides, drug overdoses, and um, cirrhosis um, rising before the Great Recession, rising during the Great Recession, and rising after the Great Recession. And we have a line on that graph that says, where is the Great Recession? Show me the Great Recession in this picture. And it had no effect on those at all. I mean, it was driven by other forces. And it's certainly true that we think of deaths of despair as linked to economic distress, but to a long run, slow running disaster for less educated Americans who are being sort of consistently left out of progress um, over the last 50 years. Um, and also a healthcare system that's run a mechanism helping to immiserate them. Um, so that we don't think that's much to do the, the mechanisms. You can't just jump from that and say there's going to be a lockdown, there's a lot of unemployment, a huge number of un un unemployed, and that's going to lead to suicides and overdoses and so on. It may do, but not for the same reasons that we're talking about. Um, and so it, the following is certainly true, that the people who suffered from these deaths of despair, who are less educated, Americans, people without a university degree, are also the people who are going to suffer from COVID. I mean, they're the people who are differentially losing their jobs. They're differentially the people who are risking their lives because they work in occupations that are essential. Whereas, you know, the educated elite, the people with the BAs, are sitting at home talking to each other on Skype. And we're getting paid right. probably as productive as we were before. Um. In a recent interview, you said that during depressions and recessions, uh, mortality rates decline, but suicides increase. That's correct. Uh, what, is the, what is the reason for, for both, actually, if I may? Well, I mean, you know, I don't think that, I think that's one of those high level results, which is, you know, it, it comes from a bunch of different mechanisms going on together. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be the same everywhere. And also the recession we're going through right now is different from any other recession we've ever seen. Um, and therefore, you know, I, you have, one has to be very, very careful from saying what happened in previous recessions will happen in this recession. Nevertheless, you want to look at that evidence and see what happened. Um, the Great Depression in the US was a time when mortality rates were lower than in any years around them. Um, and you see that in many countries and many times. So for not suicides, I'll come to suicides in a minute, but for not suicide, um, a lot of it is just fairly mechanical stuff. For instance, you know, people are not spending very much money. They're not driving around in fast cars. They're probably not smoking and drinking as much. And that is something you would expect right now. I mean, so New York hospitals, emergency rooms are typically full of people who've had traffic accidents or people who've injured themselves on construction sites and stuff like that. And most of that has gone away. 
So that's one of the main reasons why when economic activity slows, some of the accidental consequences of um, economic activity also slow. So I think that makes good sense. Um, people also like to spend money in ways that are sometimes harmful for them. <laughs> and if they have less money, they'll do less of that. Um, obviously, you can think of things on the other side. So the unemployment and suicide is right. Um, but, you know, in the Great Depression, there were people jumping out of skyscrapers in New York, but it turns out they're a very small number. And also, suicides are only 2% of all deaths. Um, and so you can have an increase in suicide that doesn't do much to the all-cause mortality rate, nor does it offset those other more positive, they're not positive forces, but they're positive for mortality. Mortality is not everything, of course. People trade off mortality against other things they want all the time. Um, and so it, it's a fairly narrow discussion, but it should temper accounts that say this huge recession we're having is going to cause, you know, millions of people to die that were hundreds of thousands of people to die who would not otherwise have died. Um, you mentioned the empty hospitals and the fact that a lot of people are not going to hospitals because uh, they may be afraid or they have be discouraged to go in and uh, what have you. Uh, some people refer to this as excess deaths. Uh, question is, um, how many of these excess deaths or rather, do you expect a spike in excess deaths above the, the, the COVID pandemic? Are we going to be seeing thousands or tens of thousands of people who, for whatever reason, uh, didn't get treatments and therefore died uh, in, in addition to the, the harm caused by the pandemic? Um, it's possible, and I look forward to researching that some years from now when we have the data. The term excess deaths is being currently used in a different way, yeah. which is the CDC is actually looking at deaths on a weekly basis and comparing them with deaths on a weekly basis in other years, right? And so that's, but that's mostly to get at COVID deaths that are not diagnosed as COVID deaths, right? Because there are a lot of people just being found dead at home or and who died of COVID. So there's a lot of those sort of deaths. And I'm pretty sure the official COVID numbers are understating the number of people who died from COVID, who never got to go to the hospital or who died without being tested. They're typically not testing dead people to see if they had COVID. The other one you talk about, I suspect is smaller, but I don't know. Right. And, um, you know, the question is how much, how many lives do you think are being saved by the hospital system on an average day? And I would guess not very many. <laughs> just, just to make it clear for our viewers. So there's a certain baseline that you would expect, say, to people to die in May. Yes. And when we look back at that a year from now, we'll be able to see the difference between May, May in 2019, May in 2020 and presumably it will be higher. So then the task of smart people will be to determine how much of that excess has been produced by COVID, people not going to hospitals and whatever else, right? Right. I think most of it will be COVID. Um, there's a very good website for the National Center for Health Statistics under the CDC, which shows pictures of that. The only thing you said that's not that you have to qualify a bit is the deaths in May every year are different. Right? Yes. So, in fact, if you look at excess deaths, there were quite a lot of excess deaths in the spring of 2019, too, which were actually, it was a bad flu season. So a lot of people died of flu in those days, and those are excess over what you would normally expect even in those flu months. So it's, it's going to be hard to sort all this out, but I'm sure there are some people, you know, who need to go to the hospital and just decide not to go to the hospital, and the hospital may have actually helped them. Um, and I know a lot of elderly people, for instance, who made arrangements that under no circumstances will they allow themselves to be taken to hospital. Right. A um, short while ago, you noted that the American healthcare system, in your view, is uh, um, failing, especially the people in, in the lower socioeconomic strata. I think. Um, in a recent interview, which I read, uh, you said that the American healthcare system is both 
capitalist and rent seeking. I always thought about these two terms as being polar opposites. Can you explain uh, yeah. what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's no generally agreed on definition of what capitalism is. <laughs> And, you know, so maybe we shouldn't have put that in the title of our book or, um, you know, I, I like to think about free competitive markets as wonderful things that deliver goods to millions of people and have taken enormous number of people out of poverty and that these free competitive markets um, are things that are just nearly always good. <laughs> and I would defend those. Um, capitalism as we have it in America today, is a mixture of some of that going on in a lot of markets and doing wonderful things. And other parts of it that are very severely scarred by rent seeking and other sort of things that undermine competition. And indeed, you know, as Adam Smith knew from the beginning, <laughs> we you have to protect capitalism or you have to protect free markets, um, you know, because the people who dominate free markets will often try to corrupt them in their own interests and against the public interest. And so our arguments about healthcare, first of all, and I'm not sure all your um, watchers will agree with this, um, I think healthcare cannot be delivered by free competitive markets. I think we've known that for a very, very long time. Um, Ken Arrow, one of the greatest economists of the 20th century, who actually proved the Adam Smith theorems you know, for the first time in rigorous mathematical conditions under which the invisible hand does this for us. And the great thing about those conditions is not just intellectual curiosity, but you can also identify the conditions where they won't work. And healthcare was, he wrote a very famous paper about healthcare, just showing that, you know, I think the phrase he used was, there's no socially acceptable way of delivering healthcare through free competitive markets. And you can't do it, and no country does it without extensive interference by the state. Now, some people would say, okay, let's get the state out of this altogether and let there be free competitive markets. But I don't think that's sustainable because lots of people are gonna die as a result. And I don't think we'd find that socially acceptable. And there's no rich country in the world that does find that socially acceptable. So then what you get is the system we have in America today that sort of pretends to be free market and uses that rhetoric when it suits them, but is in fact just a giant swamp of conspirators trying to rip us all off. And the result in America is we spend, you know, more than twice as much as any other country. Um, so the next highest is Switzerland with 12 and a half percent of GDP, we spend 18. Um, that excess is enough to <laughs> enough to fund our military and leave 50% over. So it's just the waste in healthcare is more than the total amount we're spending on the military. And that's because we're trying to square the circle. We're trying to pretend that we have a competitive market system. And in fact, we don't because the government has to interfere in it in so many ways, but pre keeping pretending it's a free market just leads us into this terrible swamp. So there's no good way to deliver healthcare is the answer. Um, but we have the worst and it's costing people their lives. Would you be comfortable with a system that allows for maximum competitiveness in delivery of services, but subsidizes consumption? Would that be something that comes close? Would, to everything depends on the details, but yes. Um, you know, if you look at the systems we have around the world, um, you know, it, many people think that if you deviate from what we have in America, you have socialized health care where the government is delivering health care. We don't need that. And, you know, Britain does that. The Brits love their health care system. You know, people talk about it being the national religion. I mean, I grew up there. You know, my parents had lived in a world where there was no national health system, and for them it was one of the greatest things that had ever happened in their lives. But it's not the only way of doing it. And, you know, America, I don't think, would like that. And, you know, but we've got to get away from what we have now because it's taking money out of the pockets of ordinary people and distributing it up to doctors and device manufacturers and pharma companies. Not to mention the conspiracy of pharma companies to addict the population and get fabulously rich over, you know, addicting and killing people. Other countries don't allow that. Uh, last question. Uh, we hear much about trust 
between government and the government. Uh, the Swedes supposedly trust their government to guide them through the pandemic. Americans don't. Uh, what is trust and what role does it play in, uh, uh, in, in tackling the pandemic? Well, trust is part of something that I think is very important. It's like a public good, you know. It's something that we share and that helps us do things that we can't do for ourselves. There's lots of things we can do for ourselves, but sometimes we need to be governed. And it's very good if we can trust the government. The Swedish example is a very interesting one because the Swedes are actually not doing what the government tells them. They're doing what their top health official is telling them. And that to me is wrong, actually. I mean, I think that if people are going to trust, they have to trust not the experts, but they have to trust the government. And the government, you know, the leaders are some sort of buffer between the scientific experts and the people. People, they didn't vote for that scientific expert. They voted for, uh, you know, the prime minister or whoever. And it's the politics that ought to filter that through. I'm not sure it's working here either, because we have a government that seems to be at war with its own experts. But to me, you need that. <clears throat> you need to have the politicians in between. You know, it's the politicians that need to be trusted. Um, the scientific advisors are vetted by peer review and various other things. Um, but they have to advise the, the politicians and the politicians have to make decisions and it's they who have to earn the trust. Now in the US, we have people, um, people have become very attached to their governors, which is interesting. And the governors have stepped up to sort of do that and they have taken responsibility. They listen to the scientific advisor and that seems to me the right way to do it. Um, I think trust is in the US is somewhat of a casualty of this extraordinary polarization that we have, which I think is very unfortunate. I think this crisis might bring us some of that back. I think we have to value science more than we have in recent years. Um, I think we have to value public goods more. You know, there's some things that the market can't do and public health is one of them and epidemics really show that, you know, there's lots of Public health agencies have, I think, got much too involved in things like smoking, which we can perfectly well handle for ourselves. But when it comes to an infectious disease, we've got to have trusted institutions there to help and advise us. In Great Escape, um, your, your book, um, which I read some years ago, you talk movingly about uh, growing up in Scotland amidst a great deal of poverty. And indeed, I studied in Scotland and have made some uh, elder friends who had a very similar experience. And you obviously saw a tremendous deal of human progress, not just in Western countries, but also in developing countries. 50 years from now, is the world going to be are we going to recover? Is the world going to be more prosperous, more happy, do you think? Uh, the, is, the, is the engine of progress going to be allowed to go on or do you see uh, troubles on the horizon? Well, 50 years is sort of right on the margin there. You know, I, I, as I wrote in The Great Escape, this was a 250 year horizon, sort of beginning with the Enlightenment. And, you know, but some of the worst things in human history were, happened in the 20th century. You know, so one thing I have to keep fighting against is people who claim that this progress, this, you know, this great progress is um, steady because it's not steady at all. And the danger now, I think we're in a very, very dangerous position right now. So I think if we go 100 years ahead or 200 years ahead, the forces of reason will win out and we will be happier and more prosperous and more flourishing. In the short run, you know, people talk, they compare this with the 30s, for instance, where really bad things happen. And, you know, I've, I've been saying, and Anne and I have been saying together, that this might be a moment where we actually get long needed reform of the US healthcare system. And people say to us, well, look back at the 1930s, you know, there was chaos, and America got Roosevelt, and Germany got Hitler. <laughs> and the trouble with a crisis is it's very unpredictable. Crisis is not a good way of reforming things because it's very unpredictable what is going to happen. So we could be in for a bad 10 or 20 years, um, but maybe we'll try and for the short run. That would be good. In the meantime, we will all keep fighting for the values of the Enlightenment. I'm uh, deeply grateful to you for the time that you have given me.
and hopefully our viewers will appreciate our chat as well. Thank you very much. Very much, very much. That's great. I enjoyed it. Bye-bye.